Hij is ontzettend leuk. Persoonlijk vind ik hem gewoon een aanwinst voor het bedrijf. En hij kan ook echt iets wat niemand anders kan. Ons primaire doel is om gevonden voorwerpen zo snel mogelijk terug te brengen naar de eigenaar. We houden daarvoor een social media in de gaten en de crew die na elke vlucht het vliegtuig checkt. Ik vind het ook wel heel erg leuk dat we natuurlijk een uh, beetje hulp daarbij krijgen. Spierkracht, uithoudingsvermogen en uh, ja, socialiseren. Ja, en als je die reactie ziet, dan is dat eigenlijk wel heel mooi. Hij komt regelmatig langs, en, uh, maar ja, ik moet ook eerlijk bekennen, ik uh, verwend wel. Mind your step. Mind your step. Good morning, Nashville. It's good to be here. Don't you just love that video? That's so cool, you know, it gives me goosebumps. The reason why I wanted to show it to you is because it shows our determination to be there for our passengers to really be of help to them. I'm not going to introduce myself because it has been done. I couldn't do it better. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, let's talk about social media. My job is really exciting, you know. It's, it's, it's so cool to be a part of the team. And, and I was there from day one. And wow, man, we've been doing great. And there's so much I could be bragging about if I liked. Like, for instance, <laughs> All the fans and followers that we have, the huge amount of conversations that we have, and the large increase in volumes. Now, that's pretty cool. I could be bragging as well about being the world's largest airline on Facebook, you know, and, 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 and having the first SLA monitor and, and, and being one of the first brands in the world to go 24-7 on social media. But not going to do that. And I might as well start about all the awards that we won, including being the world's most socially devoted brand. Now, that's pretty cool. Three years in a row, right? I'm not going to do that. Because who cares? <laughs> you know, what do you all learn from that? This is about you. This is about you, the consumer, our passengers. Without you, we wouldn't be in business in the first place. So, well, let's talk about you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you think that in five years from now, Facebook is still going to be the world's most dominant social media network? Raise your hands. Oh, man. I'm so happy Mark Zuckerberg isn't here. You can't see. I only see like two or three hands. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Another question. How many of you think that wearable tech like Google Glass and the Apple Watch are going to be as common as an iPhone is now in five years. That's the majority. But then again, who cares? Remember ICQ, right? Friendster, Arcoot. You know, it's not about technology because technology comes and goes. Again, it's about you. It's about the client, and you are the center. And all this technology is only facilitating the dialogue. And through this technology, people speak about brands. They share experiences in life. Because it says something about who they are, something about their personality, right? And they can really make or break a brand, because these shared experiences are so important. People rely on each other. To give an example, I'm sure most of us have been to a restaurant where we had dinner and, you know, the food was okay, but 
really not that great, you know? Sure, I mean, we paid the bill, left a tip for the waitress, and left. But then, the next day, we tell our friends and colleagues, don't go there, it's not really good. Or even worse, write a review online. That's the power of sharing experience on social media. And Jeff Bezos once said, your brand is what people say about you when you are not in the room. Very few of you after this talk come to me and say, hey, Jochen, I really liked it, or hey, actually it was crap. Uh -uh. More likely you're gonna put it on Twitter, and I cannot see that video wall from here. But afterwards, it will be online. So that's the power of shared experiences on social media. And in fact, it's total anarchy. You can say whatever you like, actually, as long as it's not illegal. And you can't deny it. It is there. It is fact. And you cannot stop it either. Like they tried in Turkey earlier this year. It's a fact. Now, here's an example of a little video which was put on Vine. The six, minute, six second loop video of a baggage handler at Schiphol, let's say, not taking his job too seriously. That's not very good for our reputation. For your information, he doesn't work for KLM anymore. So, is that a social threat? Is that going to harm our reputation? Potentially, yes. But we believe differently. We believe that it provides great opportunities. You know why? Great opportunities to get in touch with you, the consumer, the people who experience our products. And so we engage. We sit and talk and we listen and we learn from you and we love to get inspired. For many, sending a tweet to a company has become just as normal as for any other one to just call the call center. That means that if you do not reply to a tweet, it's just as annoying as a call center not picking up the phone. The phone is ringing, you have to answer. Great, but how do we do that? Because that's what I'm here today to talk about. We strive to create a fantastic customer journey, a seamless customer journey in which we provide value and relevance. And we apply social media as much as we can to deliver that. We have all these different tools, services, things which we created on social media to be there throughout that customer journey. Second, if you want to be successful on social media, it will take a cultural change. Now, KLM is a big company, and the aviation industry, from, by nature, is, is very conservative and very close because there's so much strategic and confidential information available. But you can't because on social media, people want answers. They want the truth, and you have to speak the truth. So that means that the culture has to change within the company. You have to be able to open up and just explain things, why the things are the way they are. And to do that, you have to cooperate. You cannot do it by yourself. So you have to break through silos and really create synergy by literally sitting together and cooperating. And that's why we established a social media hub. The social media hub is physically located at corporate communications at headquarters. That's where I sit. But we work in more locations. But here is where it all comes together. And it's not just communications people sitting here. It's people from different departments, from e-commerce, from, 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 from tactics, from, from, from te technical uh, department, from flying blue, from a very short time. So basically anyone within the company, from, from anyone on the floor up to your CEO, if we need to. I mean, I'm sitting right next to media relations, back to back. So we cooperate in that social media hub. And we have a strategy. The strategy is built as three pillars. And I'm not going to say too much about them because it's not what I'm here for. But the three pillars are customer service, brand reputation, and commerce. First and foremost, precondition to anything you will ever do on social media is that you provide service. You have to be there for your clients. You have to listen and to be of help. And we do that by providing a one-stop shop. 
if you send a message to KLM, we're not going to refer you to any department. We're going to do it ourselves as much as we can. We are going to do the homework for you. That's why we have this big network. That's why we cooperate and break through silos. And we do that on six platforms, 24 seven in 11 languages. We are planning to add even more languages. We respond within an hour and if we can, even faster. Our goal is to bring it back to 30 minutes and on average, we do stay within 30 minutes. So only if you have that in place, and if, only if it works really well, then you can start thinking about creating stuff worth sharing, engaging people with great, inspiring um, uh, campaigns. And maybe you might even be able to make a little money, which we, by the way, do. So let's talk about, funny clicker. <laughs> so let's talk about customer service, because that's the most important pillar of a strategy. If you want to be a good social media service agent, and we have over 150 of them, it's a large team, the largest team in the world, it takes two things, knowledge about the company, products and services, policies, stuff like that, and the other is mindset. And the mindset, that's where I come in. The mindset is put down in a document called the Rules of Engagement. And it contains tips and tricks, do's and don'ts on how we engage on social media. How do we deal with specific situations? And I'll turn a voice. And the document itself is absolutely strictly confidential. I'm not going to share it with you. However, I'd like to give you a, a peek preview. What is the document actually really about? And this is something we've never opened up about before until very recently. So let's look at the document. If you want to be a great agent, you need three, um, three things for your mindset. First of all, you have to be a facilitator. You have to be a detective and a plumber. <laughs> Sounds a bit funny, you have to be a plumber, you know? So let me explain. To be a facilitator means that you facilitate an authentic, open dialogue. That you are authentic, that you listen, that you care, that you show true interest in your clients. And maybe even best part of it, give the stage to your clients. Like Bono from U2 did here, actually right here in Nashville a few years ago, with a blind guitar player he invited on stage to play along with them. You have to embrace any feedback. But then, I mean, anyone can engage and facilitate a nice dialogue. But that's only the beginning. To give an example of that dialogue, here are, I mean, if you are authentic enough, people will really, really love it. These are um, conversations that went even kind of viral, you know? 20,000 likes on a question by a passenger on our Facebook wall. 20,000 likes, wow. Because it was just so authentic. Another example, there was a kid named Eve, only six years old. And uh, for his school, he had an assignment. They went to a museum in the north of Holland and they were asked to make a painting of any topic, their favorite topic. And with that painting, they were asked, asked to raise money for UNICEF. Now that's a real, real great charity. And if he decided to make a painting of his favorite topic, which was KLM. So he drew this KLM, painted this KLM plane. And he very proudly showed it to his mother. And his mother posted it on our Facebook wall. Now we could have just liked that message. We could have added, wow, Eve, how nice. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. <sighs> Come on, there's more to it. So we invited him to headquarters and asked him to hand over that painting personally to our CEO at the time. And of course, we asked him to bring a friend. And he got a Skipple tour and, and the goodies. And of course, we made a really nice donation to UNICEF. Now that's authentic. That's a nice story to tell. So the second part of the mindset is that you are a detective. Now what exactly does it mean? If you want to understand what's going on, if you want to understand what someone is talking about or complaining about, you have to really, really understand everything that's to it. So get your hands on any available information and analyze it. And here's where the being naive part comes in. It's part of my role, it's part of my role to ask questions. I don't take things for granted. Why do we do it? Does it make sense? 
should we change it? And I really get inspired through social media. And I don't want to know everything because if I would know everything that we do, I might take it for granted. So by remaining purposely naive, by not even trying to know everything that we do, I will keep asking questions. And we get to new insights through that. How many of you have children? Raise your hands. Oh, quite a lot. Have you ever been on a plane with your children? <laughs> you must recognize that situation. Huh? I have a lot of respect for every parent traveling with their children on a plane, trying to entertain them and try to keep them calm. Wow, that's not an easy job. But what about them? They're not having a great flight either, are they? There's two sides to each story. And if you are a detective, you have to make sure that you look at things from different perspectives. Let me give you another example. I have a lot of respect for passengers of size trying to feel comfortable in a very narrow seat. They're not really having a very comfortable flight. But what about the poor guy sitting behind him? There are two sides at least to each story. Investigate, be detective, and make sure you understand the whole story. And only then, only then, you might be able to become a plumber. Another thing which we use is big data, or small data, if you like, where we connect all our systems through a customer API to get all the information together in one place. So we don't have to ask for your frequent flyer number. We don't have to ask for your next flight because we already have that information. Just give me your name and we'll look it up for you. Talking about a one-stop shop. So if you do all that, you can be a plumber. And a plumber means that you really, really fix it and not just post a plaster because that's not going to work. You have to add value and relevance. And you might have to be very creative to do that. Not just think in policies and limitations, hey, that's the way we do it. No, be creative. What other options do we have? Get off the beaten track, you know? And do it fast, don't waste time. This car is not fixed. You can keep adding Band-Aid and duct tape every day over day over day, but that bumper just needs to be replaced. Fix it. And this is something I see quite often on social media. Brands engage, they try to be cool, but they're not really being of help. And we listen. We have had zillions of examples of where we really improved what we do just by getting inspired through social media. But every once in a while, things may not exactly work out the way we planned. You know, it's people's business. Does any one of you recognize this image? Yeah? It didn't go, yeah, you're Dutch, of course you recognize it. Um, it didn't really go viral in the US, but it was a huge story in, in Holland and in Mexico. I'm not going to tell it now. Um, I'm convinced that all companies make mistakes. I mean, we're people, right? Now, that's okay. What matters is how you deal with that. And that's why I have to be open and transparent and authentic and just fix it, okay? So if you want to be open and transparent about it, you better do. We, both, we wrote several blogs about our own bloopers, really. If you make a mistake, we'll admit it. And here's a case study I'd like to share with you. This is a case study about a, an indigenous Philippine girl. Her name was Arjean. And um, she was traveling from the Philippines via Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, to Amsterdam with a through connection to Rio de Janeiro, to Brazil. And when she was boarding KLM in Kuala Lumpur, she was denied boarding. She was not allowed to board the airplane. And that's an interesting story. We heard about it because an organization called the Goodex Foundation posted upon it, about it on their own Facebook page. It was a very long emotional story about what had happened to our gene. And we only heard about this story because it was shared on our wall as well. And we could not get in touch with our gene directly. But we read the story with interest. And at one point it said, 
Arjin was denied her right to travel. This could also be perceived as a possible case of discrimination based on appearance, gender, ethnicity, nationality, age, or social status. Wow, that is one very, very serious complaint. KLM is a global carrier. We've been there for 95 years, the oldest airline in the world. We bridge countries, we bridge cultures, we do not discriminate. So if anyone says this about us, we take it extremely serious. So this was escalated to the social media hub and I was asked to have a look at it. And I had a broader look. And the only thing I could do is just start an investigation. I really, really wanted to understand what was going on here. So the most important thing to do is to contact all the stakeholders, contact our staff in Kuala Lumpur, check her ticket conditions, check everything. What exactly was the story? And soon enough, I figured out that it was indeed not a matter of discrimination. <sighs> Relief. It was, let's say, a matter of paperwork, you know, um, visas and stuff like that. So I wrote a reply. The storyline basically said, we are taking this very serious. We are, of course, investigating. We want to know exactly what's going on here. But for your information, KLM does not discriminate. We really don't do that. But at the same time, we have a very strict privacy policy, so we are we're not going to confirm to anyone that she was indeed traveling with us. That's personal information. And we were not in touch with our gene directly. We were in touch with people now starting to bash our wall about the situation and started asking us questions. So this is all basically we could do. But there were a few challenges. Because we were dealing with different locations, the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Amsterdam, and Brazil, it was hard to get all the stakeholders aligned at the same time. People were do have to sleep, you know, eventually. And uh, there was, of course, our privacy policy, and we learned that the whole trip of our gene was organized by the GoodX Foundation through a national crowdfunding um, campaign with the goal of having her meet the Pope in Brazil. Wow. And that made it a very symbolic trip. And that's why it sparked extreme emotions in the Philippines. So what could we do? We had no other choice than to recognize the GoodX Foundation as a representative, because we couldn't get in touch with Arjun directly. And once we had all the facts straight, we could make her travel arrangements and say, okay, you're good to go. And we put on the first possible flight and ensured a hassle-free trip through, uh, throughout. So she was meet at the airport and you know, got all this um, uh, assistance. But it wasn't enough. It was already picked up by national media in the Philippines. And they posted this very negative story about us, basically saying KLM is discriminating. Solely based on that Facebook page, that one Facebook post. And they never checked the facts. And this post was picked up by a famous TV celebrity in the Philippines with almost three million followers. And he was retweeted by a news anchor with also a large following of 1.35 million. And because we had so many messages coming in, because this was going viral, we unfortunately missed the fact that they were so influential. We didn't get a chance to read their profiles and to realize that they're influential, which is a pity, you know. Because what happened next? Bang, it went all over the place. More than 200,000 shares of that article. Now we were in trouble and people really, really started to attack our Facebook wall with images like these. Completely biased, KLM does not discriminate and this was not a case of discrimination. But the whole story, the whole emotion, all the emotions were only based on that single Facebook message which was incomplete and making false statements. And the media never checked the facts with us. Now we had no other choice than to step away a bit from our privacy policy and tell the world, yes, our gene is indeed traveling with us. We did not discriminate her, but rest assured, she's on the first possible flight. She is on her way. 
and we also acknowledged the emotions which people had about it. But it didn't work out. I mean, that message was targeted straight at the Philippines and at Malaysia, targeted straightly at all the people involved. But no one cared. Now it was all over the news throughout Asia. And people were blaming us of racism and discrimination. Now what do you do? This really gave me sleepless nights, literally. It only came to an end, only, after she had indeed taken her flight and had arrived in Brazil. And once she was in Brazil, it kind of settled. And on top of that, finally the national news on television broadcasted our statement. That's when it came to rest. <laughs> and maybe the most interesting thing, the news anchor of that program where it was broadcasted was the very same news anchor that retweeted that message in the first place. Well, thank you very much. So what did we learn from this? Very crucial, you have to identify your key players and engage them, focus on them in the first place. Because they are the ones that can make things change, you know, sentiment. You have to cooperate. And, and, and realize that if you don't act fast, that media can take rumors for a fact, which clearly happened in this case. And you know, you can't win them all, unfortunately. Here's another story. Honey, Honey, <laughs> yeah, we, the, the Dutch is here, we can say that. Honey is um, a Dutch woman, and she approaches on Twitter, saying that she was very, very disappointed in the KLM. And why was he so disappointed? Because we refused to give her brother and his wife and baby kid an upgrade on their journey to Australia. Her brother had cancer, uncurable cancer. And he, they as a family wanted to take, make this last trip, you know, to visit their family. And they had been asking for an upgrade. Many people ask for an upgrade every day. And no matter through which channel you approach KLM, whether it's on Twitter, or Facebook, at the desk, the phone, customer care, or maybe even a letter to your CEO, you have to get the same answer everywhere. And our policy is we don't just upgrade people because. A lot of people have a very good reason to be upgraded. They're either sick, ill, or they're elderly, or very tall, or very tired, or very important, or well, just because, <laughs> you know? Um, so no, we were not going to do that. But at the same time, looking into the story, I understood her so very well. I really felt her pain. I felt so much empathy for her. Wow, man, if you are about to lose your brother, you're going to do everything you can, everything, to make this lost memory a great one, okay? Still giving me goosebumps, you know? This is a very, very emotional story. And so what could we do? Um, I double-checked her ticket conditions, or the, her brother's ticket conditions, and they were really not changeable. But still, you know, we made the exemption, and we made it changeable, and, 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 and um, free of charge, and, and, and advising me, you know, they might consider economy comfort with a bit more lax space, and we made all these additional arrangements, just ensuring a hassle-free trip as much as we could, having everyone lined up to have a great trip, including the crew. But she didn't take that for an answer. Now on her own Facebook page, she wrote a complaint to her friends saying, hey, Caleb doesn't give a shit. Hey, come on, man, we done all that stuff and we were being very, very reasonable, we explained, but she didn't accept. And now her friends started to mingle in. They were starting to attack us. Hey, KLM, you have to do something. They wrote tweets to our CEO. They even involved the press. And media did pick up. They said KLM is denying to upgrade this very ill man. Come on, show your heart. <sighs> now what do you do? If we, if, we, if we would upgrade her brother, which I truly would love to do, then how about all the others, right? There's so many people with a very legitimate reason asking for an upgrade. 
So what do you do? This was a tough one. And then in another post on her wall, I saw replies coming in with people saying, you know, what if we would donate our freaking flyer miles or, you know, could we sponsor you to do something like that? And that's when I got inspired. So, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, through our regular policies, there's nothing we can do for you. Unfortunately, it's heartbreaking, but unfortunately, there's nothing we can do for you. But let's think out of the box. We have this charity program, KLM Air Cares, and people can donate their flying blue miles for that project. Why not set up some kind of personal charity? Why not? So let's just do it. So I sat together with a few stakeholders and discussed it, and we, we decided to take on this experiment and just do it, see how far it gets. And if any surplus miles would be you know, that donated, then we would uh, give them to uh, KLM Air Cares. Deal. So I called Honey and discussed it with her, and she was really happy, and she was so happy that finally something at least was happening. We made the technical arrangements and informed everyone involved. People could donate not only through social media, but also by phone. So the next thing she did was to call out to her friends on Facebook again and say, I need your help. I need miles, a lot of miles to have my brother and his family upgraded to business class. And we gave her about a week to do so. And guess what? In one single day, all the miles were in. And that was a lot of miles, really. And now she was so happy. And she was thanking her friends, and she was thanking KLM for that. And I was relieved. I was really relieved and truly happy. We, I talked to her on the phone a lot of time. We exchanged numbers and just kept keeping in touch all the time. And fortunately, the media picked it up as well. And they said, wow, Caleb really, really showed their heart. They did something great. And I was happy. So what did we learn from this? It proved that you have to think beyond the obvious, that you have to be uh, creative in fixing things, that you have to cooperate and that you can learn so much from all the inspiration that you can get through social media. That's why I said it's not a social threat, it provides great opportunities. And for your information, this was just a pilot, an experiment, but we are working on making a ration to have this a permanent service we can offer to our passengers. Third and last case study is about the MD-11, and this one is really, really recent. You know the MD-11, the aircraft? And before I get into it, I have to really give, give all the credits to my three colleagues here, Rogier, Charlie, and Gedi. Rogier is part of the social media editorial team. Charlie is a captain and training manager of the MD-11, and Gedi is one of our press officers. The MD-11 is really admired by a lot of people because of its iconic characteristic design with a third engine in its tail. And for years, we have had a very nice um, uh, relationship, I could say, with the Dutch Aviation Photographers Group, DAPG. And they, they're so fanatic. I mean, they're at our runways every single day, taking the most fantastic pictures of our aircraft. So we do engage with them a lot. And at one point, the person who started that group said, you know, look at this great picture of KLM. They are the very last airline in the world to operate a passenger version of that aircraft. And it's true, the very last airline. And someone else said, you know, this is so special. People come from all over the world just to see it because it's so beautiful. They call them the ladies. They're kind of sexy, you know, they call them by their first name because the aircraft named like Florence Nightingale, Maria Callas, so then they said, Hey, there's Florence, or there's Audrey, or there's, really, they love these planes. And I can kind of rely to it, you know. Back in a former life, I used to be a flight attendant for KLM. I worked on this machine for 10 years, and I loved it as well. It is really, truly great machine. Now look at this guy. I mean, this is one of those photographers, and he's really fanatic. He even has an MD-11 tattoo on his arm. Wow! <laughs> 
Now that's an ambassador, isn't it? So when we announce that we're going to do some fleet renewal and order other aircraft, people were starting to like complain <laughs> about us modernizing our fleet. Do not retire the MD-11. Can you delay it? No, don't do it. Wow, you should keep flying the MD-11. Come on, it's not an aircraft, right? So somewhere along the process, well, here, my colleague, he posted this selfie with an MD-11. And he called it an MD selfie. And it instantly became a meme with other people doing exactly the same thing. Because while they still had a chance to picture themselves with an MD-11, they wanted to do it. And there's me as well in the lower left corner. And the, the most funny of them all, I think, is this one. This guy obviously photoshopped himself into an <laughs> How cool is that? So more and more posts started to come in, to come in from all these MD-11 fans. It can't, can you, 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 KLM, you got to do something. You can't just let go of this aircraft since it's so special. You have to do something for its fans. We love these ladies. And then at one point, Barry Schuring, one of the uh, photographers, he sent a very emotional uh, post on our wall. And he said, Caroline, it truly gives me tears in my eyes to see this lady go. I love her so much. And I don't know what, but we have to do something. So that's when my colleague Rogier came in. He invited him. He even went a step further. I mean, Barry started his own Facebook page. KLM, you have to keep one MD-11 just for the heritage. He even started a petition. Wow. And he was really serious about it. So we invited him at our office. And we're here to talk to him just to exchange ideas. You know? OK, we're very willing to listen and to all your suggestions, you know, not just from Barry, but from everyone. And um, he put together a group of people, and by truly cooperating and really co-creating together with the aviation photographers group, they came up with this great idea. We organized on one day, the 11th of the 11th, three farewell flights. And tickets were sold at one particular date and still started 11 minutes past 11. And 600 tickets were available at 111 euros. <laughs> and believe it or not, 600 tickets, they were sold out in less than four minutes. Now, if you didn't believe me that these fans are serious, now maybe you do. We were flabbergasted. Wow, you know? But we did more. We launched a website, and that website we invited all these fans to share on a timeline their best pictures, their best memories of this MD-11. And more than a thousand people did. And then next we started a challenge. We challenged all these fans who had not been able to buy a ticket to test their knowledge of the KLM MD-11. How much do you know about this aircraft? And more than 200,000 people joined in. Wow, talking about fans, right? One of the questions was, how many MD-11s did KLM once have? And we gave away prizes to those who joined, including real tickets for that farewell flight, but also simulator sessions. Wow, would you like to be in a real MD-11 simulator? That's kind of cool, you know? And relics like this armrest and some KLM goodies. So when the farewell flight was finally there, by the way, that, that's Barry sitting here, really happy, brought us some. It was, it was a blast. It was, really, it, was, it was a party. But at the same time, it was a party, yes. But it was, it was kind of sad, too. These people were emotional. So I mean, since the aircraft was never going to be used anyway, they just started to sign it wherever they could and put a signature and put personal, personal messages to that specific aircraft. So the aircraft Florence, she got messages like, Dear Florence, I'm going to miss you. Now, the aircraft had become personalities. Bye bye, beautiful. I love that one. Tom Melody, the very 
first pilot ever to fly the MD-11. He was invited on board to be there. And even he said, this is a sad day. And after the flight, these are the kind of messages which we got. Thanks for everything. Farewell. Oh, <laughs> you know? It's an aircraft. It's a piece of it's a machine, you know? <laughs> So uh, Charlie, by the way, he was the, the captain on all those flights, and he also initiated this book, which was put together um, with a complete story of our whole history with, with MD-11 aircraft and, and McDowell Douglas aircraft. We were the only airline to have all models ever since the 30s. 6,000 copies, almost sold out, really. Key learnings from this one, brand value is not just about money. It's very much about emotions. And your brand ambassadors are crucial here. You have to cherish them. And make sure that you identify great opportunities and take them. So to wrap it up, if you want to be successful on social media, it takes knowledge and a mindset. And the mindset comes down to this. You have to be a facilitator, a detective, and a plumber. And if you are so, only if you are so, then you can be successful to be there for you, for our passengers, the people who like us or not. And that also answers a very important question. What exactly is the ROI of social media engagement? We spend so much money on doing this with a huge, huge team. What does it give us in return? Well, I'm convinced that the soft ROI of social media engagement is very simple. Thumbs up. Online sentiment. Get a grip on online sentiment. And that's priceless. And like Andrew Agassi once said, image is everything. Thank you very much. <laughs>